<clears throat> again, um, Mark Youngquist, and he's going to tell us about the 143rd in Iraq. Okay. Oh, thank you for having me on. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the things that motivated me to write the book was that uh, I had been doing presentations when we got back from Baghdad after 2004. And I would run across people who knew about the unit or knew somebody in the unit. And I'd relay a story to them about that soldier or the unit. And not one person had ever heard any of the stories or, or anything about them. And I'm talking about close personal friends, um, family members, coworkers, employers. And it got down to the point where I sent a letter to Governor Malloy. He was the governor at the time, not when we deployed. Uh, and I asked him, I said, uh, sir, do you know that one of the state troopers on your personal security detail is Andrea Cloutier, now her, maiden, her name is now Andrea O'Donnell, uh, was one of our soldiers in Iraq and received a medal for valor, for bravery, for rescuing a wounded soldier under fire. Uh, six of our MPs went to the aid of three other wounded MPs from another unit uh, under fire, and, and, and they were able to save two, and unfortunately, a young lady uh, did not survive. Uh, but Governor De Malloy did not know this about one of his own state troopers on his personal security detail. So that kind of motivated me uh, to write the book, to try and tell the story. And the offshoot of that is the guard throughout the country, not just in Connecticut, has been playing a major role in every military deployment uh, since Desert Storm. Uh, right now, there's approximately 5,000 guardsmen in the state of Connecticut, and they are scheduled to deploy to combat zones or warm places, 1,300 of those 5,000 soldiers. Now, right now, we've got a battalion, approximately 500 soldiers from the 102nd Infantry uh, in a place called Djibouti. And I'm pretty sure most of your listeners have never heard of a country called Djibouti or be able to spell it. And on top of that, they don't know where it is. And it is on the Horn of Africa. It uh, borders Somalia, a very uh, dangerous place. Uh, it is across a narrow strait from the country of Yemen, where there's a civil war going on, which is uh, a certain group is backed by uh, Saudi Arabia. Another group is backed by Iraq. And our soldiers are in uh, Djibouti at this narrow location, which is the entrance to the Red Sea and the southeastern end of the Suez Canal. And we know just how important the Suez Canal is after that boat went sideways in there, how much commerce passes through there. So we've got guardsmen there. Now we just sent 50 to 60 more to Kosovo, our aviation unit, helicopters. Uh, and they have been supporting NATO in Europe since the Bosnia and Kosovo conflicts happened back in the 90s, and they're still doing it. Uh, two years ago, a unit just rotated in and out for an entire year in uh, Poland in support of NATO operations. So the guard is not the guard of the 60s and 70s, where if you want to avoid the draft and not go to Vietnam, you join the guard. If you join the guard, you will be on active duty almost guaranteed a year out of your six-year commitment. That's over and above your regular training time. And... I tried to bring that out in the book. When we deployed, we were assigned uh, to Western Baghdad to help with uh, law enforcement from the ground up and to be law enforcement. And we were assigned to an active duty uh, military police battalion out of Germany. They should have shown up with their battalion headquarters and three companies and then had a guard company augment them. They showed up with their headquarters company, one of their own companies, 150 to 180 soldiers. They borrowed a company from another MP battalion in Germany, and they were augmented by six National Guard companies. There were more guardsmen in the active duty battalion than there were active duty soldiers. Now, when they rotated out, this was about January of 2004, 
we ended up with a battalion headquarters from the Tennessee Army National Guard. And all six of the companies were National Guardsmen. That's how big a role the National Guard is playing. Now, back on uh, election, uh, excuse me, not election day, but on inauguration day, they dispatched 25,000 guardsmen to DC. The District of Columbia does not have 25,000 guardsmen. Those guardsmen came from all across the country, including Connecticut. I believe it was about 200 guardsmen from Connecticut there for the inauguration. Uh, and this is the role the guard is now playing. It's not, you know, it's no longer one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. They're playing an active role. And if you look at the news every night, you will see guardsmen setting up medical facilities for the COVID shots. They'll be directing traffic. They'll be logging people in. The medics will be uh, giving the inoculations. They're playing a very active full-time role in the U.S. military. The U.S. military has just gotten so small, the active duty, that they can't go anywhere without the Guard and the Reserves. And I decided to tell that story. Other thoughts? Anybody out there? Yes, we're here. So, uh, and you know, the, the book, has, and, and even today, the, the kicker is even today, I am still running into people that don't know this, that, you know, don't know about our company and what they did there. Uh, ah, I ran into Governor Lamont last November at a uh, Veterans Day uh, ceremony at the Middletown Veterans Cemetery. He just happened to be walking past me. I said, you know, morning, Governor. Uh, how are you doing? He noticed my baseball cap. I had a 143rd MP company baseball cap on. He goes, oh, were you with the 143rd? I go, oh, yeah, I was there uh, with the company in Baghdad in 2003, 2004. And he thought for a minute and goes, oh, yeah, that was before things got bad. And he caught me flat-footed. And before he could say anything, of course, he moved on. He had a lot of other people to schmooze with besides me. But I'm thinking, okay, uh, 15 Purple Hearts for wounds received in action, uh, 13 um, Army Commendation Medals with V for Valor for Bravery Under Fire, 50 Small Arms Engagements with Rifles and Machine Guns, another 50 Attacks with Rockets, Mortars, uh, Rocket Propelled Grenades, uh, Improvised Explosive Devices, I have, I have to think that he had no idea how bad we had it during the course of that year. Now, did things get worse after we left? I'm going to have to agree with him on that. Uh, I came out with the last crew from our unit on April 2nd. And I believe it was either April 8th or April 8th or 9th. <clears throat> Uh, we lost Sergeant Felix Del Greco in an ambush. He was with the 102nd Infantry. They had, they had just rotated in. He had only been there a few days, and uh, he was attacked in the same area we had been patrolling for a year. Uh, and he was our first Connecticut National Guard casualty that I'm aware of. And, uh, yes, it, it did get worse, but we did not have it easy. Questions? Am I muted? No. No, are you? Okay. How did the Iraqi men and women um, feel about you coming over? Were they open arms or were they very, very standoffish? It ran hot and cold. Um, mm -hmm. There was some cooperation but you got to keep in mind, our unit rolled into Baghdad May 10th, 2003. This was technically right after the 
hostilities ended on May 1st, according to President Bush. Now, we had just been bombing and killing them for two months prior. Mm -hmm. So being welcomed with open arms, in some respects, yes, it did happen. They, they, there were a lot of people that were glad that Saddam was gone. Uh, there were a lot of people that were glad that they, the Shia were no longer under the thumb of the Sunnis. Uh, then again, we had been killing them for two months, and we had killed a lot of their people back in uh, Desert Storm. And in the Middle East, they hold grudges forever. Mm. And there were a lot of people cheering in the streets uh, with the idea was, okay, we're going to leave now. And of course, we were there for seven years. And that started wearing on them. And they did not like the fact that uh, Christians and Jews from a foreign country were, were in their country. And the old hatreds that had been tampered down by Saddam Hussein, uh, keeping the factions from, you know, warring each other, uh, boiled over. The first couple of months we were there, there was a lot of killing going on, and it was Sunni on Shia, not Americans, not coalition forces. And then uh, ooh, we're going into February 2004. There was one day the radio was burning up with all kinds of attacks. And it's like, oh boy, you know, this, you know, they're coming after us. And at the end of the day, it was all Sunni and Shia on each other. No coalition forces were involved. So it, and, and another thing, there, it wasn't a one dynamic, it wasn't a one, one opposition. We were there against what was left of the Republican Guard that, you know, wanted to keep the war going. We were there between the Sunni and the Shia who wanted at each other, and we were trying to keep the peace between both of them. There is their version of organized crime. You're in a city of Baghdad of 6 million people. Uh, New York City is 8 million. Imagine a city of 6 million people with all the crime of New York City, except everybody's got an AK-47. Uh, we were interrupting the drug trade. We were interrupting the extortion. We were uh, interrupting all the illegal activities. So we had, you know, guerrillas going after us. They were importing foreign fighters from all over the world. Uh, Palestinians were coming after us. Uh, people from Bosnia and Kosovo, Muslims from there, uh, Chechens from Russia. Uh, just for a chance to get at coalition forces, specifically American forces. So it wasn't a one dynamic. We, we were fighting a multifaceted uh, situation. I can remember being in the battalion headquarters of several months into the, uh, the war or the peacekeeping mission. And we had big screen TV in there, and it was always on CNN or Fox News. And that's where we were getting our, our fastest intelligence from was this TV. And it wasn't from the talking heads on, uh, on the TV. It was from the embedded reporters that were reporting live from actions that were actually happening in Baghdad. And this one clip cuts to uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. And he's with this smiling voice and his squinty eyes. He's proclaiming that there's only 600 disgruntled members of the old Republican Guard. And once we're done with them, you know, we're going home and we're all looking at each other, you know, senior NCOs and officers. It's like, holy, look, we're out of here on Saturday. We're killing or capturing 500 a week. This is cool. And then we realize he's, he's talking crap. We know what we're up against. And he's saying there's 500. We're taking 500 off the street every week. And of course it went on for seven years. Uh, and everything was done Temporarily, I, I remember going to a division staff meeting, and the vi division was encompassing probably close to 50,000 soldiers uh, of various units that were in the division or supporting the division. And his two-star general, that's getting way up there, is doing this briefing, and he informs us that half of all the rolling stock military vehicles in Baghdad are inoperable. No spare parts. 
And I'm saying, well, you know, a cracked windshield, that could disable a vehicle, but then you just, you know, do a memorandum and say, okay, you got, we're going to wait for the windshield to new one. We're going to keep using it with cracked windshield. And then he goes on to say, we don't have tires. We don't have tank treads. We have blown hydraulic lines. We're running out of oil. All things mechanical that you can't operate the vehicle unless you have them. So here we are, a mechanized American unit, and half everything we got won't run. Our generators were stopped running because everybody predicted, okay, we're going to be out of here in 120 days. We don't need this big, long supply chain you know, to, um, to supply us because we're just going to be in and out. No big deal. And again, seven years. Uh, as an MP company, our main battle weapon was a thing called a Mark 19 grenade launcher. It looks like a big machine gun, and it throws a 20 millimeter grenade out to about 1,500 meters with accuracy. Very devastating, but have been very intimidating weapon. We had 45 of them. They only gave us enough ammunition for two. We dragged these things around Baghdad for a year with no ammunition. I mean, that is some of the insane things. The, the, the first insane thing, uh, somebody once said, you know, Mark, I read your book. It sounds, it sounds like a cross between MASH meets Hogan's Heroes. And it started off with, we're activated, knowing we're going to the desert, February 7th, 2003, they sent us to Fort Drum, New York. Fort Drum, New York is on the east end of Lake Ontario in New York State. It starts snowing there in November. It ends around May or June. We drove to Fort Drum in a 38 degree below zero snowstorm to get ready for desert warfare. When we left Fort Drum, the temperature kept bouncing between 26 and 34 degrees. It was either wet snow or freezing rain. We got off the airplane in Kuwait 105 degrees in a sandstorm. Troops were falling over, unloading the duffel bags out of the plane because we, we couldn't handle the heat. The fortunate thing, all our vehicles were on ship. They were coming from Texas. We got there three weeks ahead of the equipment. So we had three weeks to walk around in Kuwait and you know get acclimatized. Uh, Still, that didn't help because you go into July and August, uh, the outside temperature was 120 degrees. The inside temperature in the vehicles was 150. Now, I say 120 degrees and I say 150, and, I'm, and I lived through it, and I know nobody can live in 150 degrees. But I had a thermometer in my hand that was reading 150 degrees. And... One time I was in the back seat and I figured, okay, I'll let the window down just a little bit. The windows were uh, laminated, so they were somewhat, they weren't bulletproof, but you know, they would stop some shrapnel. And you kept it up because that protected the side of your face. And then we had our old body armor. We didn't have armored vehicles. We'd hang our old body armor in the door as protection. And we had our feet on sandbags like it was World War II. And I figured, okay, I'll, I'll let the window down just enough and I'll get a breeze. In. The breeze hurt. It was painful. And when I came back, uh, my primary care doctor looked at me and goes, you know, Mark, for somebody who's been in the desert for a year, your skin looks great. I feared, you know, you, you'd be, you know, all eaten. I go, we wore sleeves down. We wore gloves. We wore bandanas, goggles. There was no exposed skin. She goes, well, why? I go, it hurt. If you were up in the turret and you were in a 40 mile an hour wind, and you didn't have a bandana on your face, you didn't have the gun, it actually hurt. It was so hot and so painful. And we were just, you know, head to toe. And then, of course, we're wearing the body armor. The equipment we were wearing ranged in about 80 pounds. Uh, and as soon as you put the body armor on, you know, you were soaking wet underneath your jackets. And, you know, constantly drinking water. Uh, but the, the heat was unbelievable. Then we rolled into November 03, December 03, January. It actually got down to freezing with freezing rain in Baghdad. And so everybody got colds after that one. Everybody got the flu. All right. Now, 
way up north, up uh, to Crit and Moselle, and from there where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, originate, they're up in the mountains. There's snow up there. They're, they're at high elevations. And those, you know, snow-capped mountains, you know, feed down uh, and, and provide water for the rest of Iraq. Most of Iraq's population is uh, lined along the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Tigris going right through Baghdad. And it's their water source, and it's also their sewer. At the same time? Yep. Oh, yeah. What did you and, have for projection for that? I mean, it sounds oh, like no. it would have all, dairy. All, all of our water came from out of the country. We didn't drink any of the in-country in water. No, all of our water was bottled and came from, from some, some other country. Uh, I, I believe most of it came from Qatar and... Uh, Kuwait. And one of the things they started with at Fort Drum was uh, malaria pills. And I'm going, malaria pills? We're not going to Vietnam. We're, we're, we're going to Baghdad. They irrigate so much off the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. There are all these stagnant pools of water in these irrigation trenches. And there are clouds of malaria carrying mosquitoes throughout the Middle East. Uh, we had to absolutely sleep under mosquito netting or we'd be eaten alive. Uh, it, it, was, it was just unbelievable. When, when we first got to Baghdad, uh, you know, we were in disarray. I was just sleeping on a cot out on the street inside the compound. And I hadn't thought twice about setting up the mosquito netting because we didn't have that problem down in Kuwait. I woke up the next morning. I was red dots all over myself. I got eaten alive in my sleep. So that, after that, it was, you know, definitely put up the mosquito netting and, and spray your cot down before you got on it. Mm. You know, th things, that, things that people don't know, you know, this, this isn't, my book's not, you know, Chris Kyle, the American Sniper. This isn't, you know, Green Beret, the train got trained for three or four years. Uh, uh, sure. So, well, it's been spared. Uh, these were your neighbors. Uh, we did go with a good core of law enforcement officers. We had seven state troopers. We had 12 municipal officers and 14 Department of Corrections officers. So we had a good, solid core of highly trained people. Yeah, to right. I wasn't going to take my pocketbook. How did your body armor differ from, say, I'm, I know, how did your body armor differ from state troopers' body armor or police body armor? Uh, the basic material of the troopers or police officers in our body armor is the same material. It's Kevlar. Uh, the Kevlar in the uh, body armor we wore is thicker because it's designed to stop uh, more high velocity rounds than a uh, state trooper would. On top of that, there are two plates that go in the front and the back. They're ceramic plates. Uh, they're called SAFI plates, and I have no idea what SAFI stands for, but they're ceramic plates, and they are rifle proof plates. M16s or the AK 47s uh, that the Iraqi has, it will stop them. Now, the helmets are not the old helmets of World War II or Vietnam, which was the same one. These were Kevlar helmets. Uh, but they were laminated a lot, much like you would laminate fiberglass. And because of the helmets and because of the body armor, I can easily say that six or seven of our soldiers survived fatal wounds. Uh, in the initial blast, uh, the first attack where we took casualties, uh, Josh Clark, who was the driver, and Al Kim, who was the machine gunner up in the turret, were hit by an IED. Josh uh, received several wounds to the left side of his body. Uh, not good ones, but not real bad ones. But his helmet stopped a piece of shrapnel that lines up exactly with his temple, that if he did not have a Kevlar helmet on, uh, he, he'd have been dead instantly. Uh, Josh Clark is now married, father of one, and a sergeant in Romantic PD. Now, the machine gunner was Al Kim. At the time, he was a Middletown police officer. And the blast tore across the front of his Kevlar helmet. And if it hadn't been a Kevlar helmet, he would have lost the whole front of his head. Uh, Al has retired. He survived. 
Uh, Al has retired from Middletown PD. He is now a Eastern Connecticut State University uh, police officer. Now going down the road a bit, a uh, number of months later, uh, Jessica Walsh, her team was hit uh, by an IED and uh, Steve Wabrick, the driver, uh, took shrapnel wounds uh, to the left side of his body where the, uh, it detonated, uh, but his helmet, again, saved his life. Now, Jessica was sitting in the passenger seat. The blast came past her for the most part and blew out her windshield and the window to her side. But she took some shrapnel to the face, and again, another piece of shrapnel lodged in her helmet right at the temple. Again, if this had been the old steel pots, you know, we'd be talking about what a, a great troop Jessica was. Now, Jessica is now the mother of a whole passel of kids and a teacher in North Stonington. Now, up in the turret was uh, Bartos Wachowski, uh, who is a sergeant on New Britain PD now, and he took a piece of shrapnel that blew up through the vehicle and struck him in that ceramic plate in the back, shattering the plate. Now, that plate can take multiple rifle rounds and not uh, be compromised. He got hit so hard, it shattered the plate. Uh, he did suffer wounds, uh, not, not as bad. If he had been wearing regular body armor without that plate, it would have cut him in half. So our body armor and our helmets uh, were really a lifesaver. Uh, former state representative from the uh, Litchfield Hills, uh, Brian Oler, came to us as a replacement and he was up in the turret on Thanksgiving day and they were returning from dinner at Baghdad International Airport back to our base when they were hit by an IED. And he was slammed in the uh, head by a chunk of concrete from uh, an IED blast. And again, if it wasn't for the, his helmet, uh, we'd be talking about what a great guy, you know, State Representative Brian Oler was. Uh, that body armor, definitely save lives. Does anyone have, yes. Did you have any military dogs there at all uh, for any assistance? We did not have any assigned to the company or the battalion, but there were a couple of times Brigade. Brigade is above battalion. Brigade is about 6,000 soldiers, six, seven, excuse me, six, a collective of six or 7,000 soldiers. A battalion was approximately 12 to 1,300 soldiers. And when we do certain missions, brigade would loan us a dog and a dog handler. So yes, there were dogs there. There were more dogs uh, utilized uh, after the first rotation, especially in Afghanistan. Uh, for searching out people, also for uh, sniffing out IEDs and mines. And they were, they were extremely successful. I don't know how any of you existed in the over 100 degree weather. It, that just blows my mind. But how in the world do you hydrate a dog sufficiently? I, you know, it just, it, it just seems impossible. For us, um, as MPs, we were always mounted up in a Humvee. There were not as many times that we were dismounted walking around. We were dismount when the troops were dismounted walking around, we had a hydration bladder, a little backpack, you know, a camelback, and you had the tube hanging here, and you just walked around with the tube in your mouth, taking a sip every minute or so. Yeah. Uh, with the dogs, you know, the dog handlers love their dogs, and they're constantly, you know, let, let them get, get a drink, making sure they stay hydrated. Uh, in the vehicles, you know, everybody had a water bottle, one of those, you know, two liter water bottles, and you just, you were constantly sipping water. Uh, I won't say we got used to it. <laughs> we became extremely tolerant of it. Uh, it, 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 it. You couldn't get away from it. You know, it was, it was just there. Uh, and, and again, I say 150 degrees, I'm going, that is physically impossible. You can't do that. And I had the thermometer in my hand. Yeah. 
Was I think there... everyone everyone ought to read your book. <laughs> um, yes, you're, you're not going to necessarily have an opinion, but I'm just asking about the withdrawal in Afghanistan. I think that's very difficult, right? It's, it's very difficult, and the Taliban there are very insistent that, okay, we'll be nice, get out. Just like the North Vietnamese said, okay, we'll let South Vietnam exist. We, we, we'll, we'll abide by the Paris Peace Accord, and that lasted two years, and then they invaded the South and, of course, took over South Vietnam. Taliban's going to do the same thing. The, the Afghan government and the Iraqi government are so fractionalized, there, there is no unity. People think our country, the United States, is fractionalized. You've got no idea what Iraq is like, and I can only speculate on Afghanistan. Now, they were playing us the whole time we were there, and the Afghans are playing us right now. How are they playing us? We were issuing, we, we started police stations from shells of building, no doors, no windows, nada. We doors, windows, computers, desks, chairs, cells, bedding, cruisers, radios, generators, weapons, you name it, we gave it to them. We outfitted the police stations and two years later it was all gone. Uh, a contact of mine, a retired Navy uh, Lieutenant Commander was in charge of building security control checkpoints in Afghanistan, border checkpoints between Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan. And these were like little compounds, little forts with everything, you know, uh, gates, fences, uh, generators, uh, mess halls, uh, barracks, command control, you know, everything you put into a good sized police station, military compound. And they were building a number of these. And American contractor was overseeing the big thing. There were some uh, Army Corps engineer people there and a lot of locals uh, doing the bulwark of building these places. And so came the day they're going to turn it over to the Afghan government. And the Afghan uh, commander goes, OK, where do I sign? Oh, no, you got to inspect the place to see that we you know, did the contract. Oh, no, I trust you. Well, you really ought to take a look before you sign. Make sure we did it right. You know, maybe we need to. No, 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 no. Once I sign, this is all ours, right? Well, yeah, we built this for you. We're turning this over to the Afghan government. We're turning this over to you. So once I sign, this is ours. Well, yeah, exactly. He signs. This is ours now, right? Yep. The truck's backed up. Anything that could be removed was ripped out. Toilets, sinks, tables, chairs, computer, electrical wiring, lights, fencing. They stripped the place. So this friend, Lieutenant Navy Lieutenant Commander, goes back to the State Department, who he's working for, and says, hey, guys, this just happened. And it's kind of like, yeah, well, what are you going to do with this? We're building five more of these. What do you want me to do? Keep building them. Now, we were issuing Iraqis brand new 40 caliber Glock pistols to the police officers. That was one of our assignments toward the end of our deployment. And these are, you know, if you went up to a Hoffman gun shop, you're, you're going to be spending 600 bucks. And one of the things we did as we were rotating out of completely being in the police station, we were doing monitoring. We would go in and inventory the weapons room. And we, Oh, Officer Mohammed, I see here by our chart you have pistol one, two, three, four, five. May I see it, please? Oh, it's in the shop being repaired. Really? You only got it a month ago. Well, you know, and uh, uh, Officer Ahmed, where's your pistol? Oh, I didn't want to get it dirty. We were giving these firearms and they were selling them on the street. And they were selling them to the people who were shooting at us. Uh, we would have 50 AK-47s in the police station to go out on patrol. We go in there, there's 20 weapons. There's only 15 guys on the road. 
well, you know, uh, they're in the shop being repaired. AK-47s and Glocks don't break. The, these, these are soldier-proof weapons. And they were selling them. Police cars would disappear. Who took it out? Oh, well, officer selling so Well, did you go to his house? He's not there. Well, where's the Crown Victoria? We, we don't know. Oh, by the way, we need another police cruiser to replace that one. So we were getting played. Uh, I got a call. I was the operations sergeant. A lot of things, I didn't do a lot of things. A lot of things went through me, if you will. I coordinated things. They needed fuel for their generator. Uh, at this time, there was rolling blackout. So the police stations were running on generator power part of the time every day. So, okay, so we rolled out 200, 200 gallons to this police station to have their generator running. Two days later, we need another load. I go, what do you need another load? Well, we're out of gas. You can't be out of gas. We just gave you 200 gallons two days ago. Well, the tank's empty. I go, oh, I'm sure the tank's empty, but it didn't go through the generator. And Mike, Mike Zakia, uh, another friend of mine, uh, wrote a nice book, uh, The Ragged Edge. Uh, he was a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel. He was training the Iraqi 5th Battalion. And they ended up uh, in the Battle of Fallujah. Now, the 5th Battalion was funded for 500 soldiers. Food, equipment, pay, 500 troops. He goes to deploy to the Battle of Fallujah. He's got 250 people in front of him. So he goes to the, the Iraqi battalion commander. He goes, uh, <clears throat> Where's the other 250 guys? You know, the Iraqi gives him this, you know, smile and shrug and, oh, you know. So 250 salaries, weapons, blankets, everything disappeared. And poor Mike Zakia goes to the Battle of Fallujah with half the guys he thought he was going with. And Mike uh, is a professor at the University of Connecticut in business. He's since retired. So both countries are playing us, and we are dumping money in there that they're just squandering. And I'm not happy with that. And I'm really not happy when I go to the Middletown uh, Trees of Honor Memorial and I read the 63 names that are there. Uh, and they're going to be adding a few more markers there in the near future. How did you maintain any sort of morale whatsoever? The American soldier is highly resilient, highly creative. Um, I mean, we made our own fun. Uh, nobody really lost it over there. When we got back and the pressure was off, you know, we, we and me, you know, have our moments. Uh, but we stayed positive. Uh, the soldiers, the, the young men and women that, that we have in the military, uh, they accomplished every assignment they were given. Uh, they were working at levels far beyond what they should have been. Uh, we had 24-year-old uh, staff sergeants running police stations telling 50-year-old Iraqi police chiefs what they were supposed to be doing, uh, which is no easy feat, especially if you were a female staff sergeant telling an Iraqi chief of police how he was supposed to be operating. And, you know, the, the, the morale was up there. I don't know. I, I can't put a, one thing on it. We just didn't let the place get us down. Uh, just just great people and uh you know i've got pictures and every time i've got a picture everybody's smiling i'm going and i, and I commented on that to somebody one time i go we're in baghdad why is anybody smiling and they're all smiling and you know just just rolled with it uh just the american youth i say american youth i was 51 and we had a couple other guys up there in that range and we just we just went with it. I, I, I can't, I can't tell you why or how, but the morale was up there. 
uh, and we were also very, very positive when we got the hell out of there. Do you have any idea how their mental health is since you came back? Uh, we have had issues with, with, with some of the troops, um, which comes from two things. One, one day we were there, and 10 days later, we were back home on our own. Uh, we flew from a place called Balad, just north of uh, Baghdad, to uh, Moran uh, Air Base in Spain, gorgeous place and beautiful. Uh, I mean, the place smelled great after being in Baghdad. And then a day later, we flew to Fort Drum. Uh, we were there for approximately 10 days of out processing. Then we bust back to Connecticut. And from there, we were on our own. So there was no, like an active duty unit, uh, the, co the cohesiveness uh, and the camaraderie was gone. We were all back to being individuals. And Nobody could really understand what we went through unless, you know, it, it, it's, it's a cliche, but until you do it, you, you, you can't understand it. And the stupid things we would, the humor, things we would do that we saw humorous over there, pe people would, you know, be aghast uh, at, at the jokes and the pranks that were pulled. Uh, and, you know, once you got back, you know, you were on your own. And some people had good support. Some people didn't. Uh, once you get back in a safe place, uh, now you can start dwelling on just everything that you went through. Uh, and there's nobody to talk to about that. So, yes, we, we, we did have some soldiers have some problems coming back. Anyone has questions, just raise your hand. What do you think could have been done differently? You know, you realize that they were just going to take the guns and take the sinks and all that. What, where could a change have been made? Probably not, right? Uh, well, there's the State Department side, and there's the military side, going all the way back to the invasion or if the stylized version, the liberation of Iraq. We only went in with about 165, 168,000 troops. Uh, Desert Storm was 500,000. We did not have the numbers of personnel on the ground to effectively control the population centers. You take New York City, for example, 8 million people, Baghdad, 6 million people. New York City has 36,000 police officers just in the NYPD to cover the five boroughs in New York. We had between 12 and 16,000 soldiers trying to control Baghdad in the middle of a war and a, you know, rebellion. I mean, we just didn't have the numbers. If you've got 36,000 cops in New York, and we're trying to do the same thing with 16,000 troops, and everybody in Baghdad's got an AK-47, it's not going to work. Now, up the road, and, and I was lost on this, just up the road from us was Fallujah, about 45 minutes away by, by car, uh, there was a limited access highway, just like an I-91 between Baghdad and Fallujah. And the insurgents would, you know, plan their activities up there in Fallujah and Ramadi, make their car bombs and their IEDs, drive down to Baghdad, plant these things, detonate them, and then boogie back to Fallujah. So, you know, we weren't finding them. And our people in Baghdad weren't getting the intelligence because they were concentrating on Baghdad and it's all coming out of uh, Ramadi and Fallujah. So it, it was very difficult at that point uh, to get a handle on it. And when we got up there, we were in several small, they call them FOPs, forward operating bases. 
and we were scattered all over uh, Baghdad. And the main compound we operated out of uh, for our military police company ha had like 12, 1300 soldiers, but we were in eight different police stations. So we were scattered all over the place and we had that influence all over Baghdad where we were, you know, blanketed there in the city, you know, in and amongst the people. Well, they decided as we were turning over control of the police stations to start consolidating everything into super fobs. So they closed down all these little fobs that were scattered all over Baghdad and they sent them up to Taji, which was north of Baghdad. And they sent them to Baghdad International Airport, which was the western side of Baghdad. And they sent them down to a place called Falcon Fob, Falcon Fob which was uh, on the extreme south end of Baghdad. And all these 10 or 15 little isolated uh, police stations and, and smaller fobs were abandoned. And now the Iraqis had insurgents had free roam wherever they wanted to go. When we were in these all these little enclaves, you know, patrols were constantly going out. It might not be patrols looking for trouble. It might be the company commander has to go out to this police station to talk to the chief. Uh, the platoon commander has to go out and check on his guys. Uh, this group has to go to Baghdad airport to pick up supplies. This group has to go to uh, the Dust Bowl uh, to pick up tires. And so U.S. patrols, coalition patrols were all over the place doing active patrolling, looking for trouble, and at the same time, just being out there doing administrative stuff, creating a presence. And they all got folded back in these major fobs, and now the insurgents could do whatever they wanted out there and have all the time in the world to do it because we weren't there. And that's when things started turning back, real bad. What do you feel that the United States accomplished by their presence? Uh, we were do removed Saddam Hussein. Uh, some people will argue the point that he was a stabilizing influence between a lot of the factions in the Middle East. Uh, I would say to that that this is a guy who uh, tried to annihilate the Kurds, uh, that invaded Kuwait, uh, that threatened uh, Saudi Arabia. They fought an eight-year war with Iran. And at the end of eight years, the border was back where it was. Uh, they helped create province between the Iran and the Iraq with the Iran-Iraq war for oil coming out of the Persian Gulf. So I, I don't see him as a stabilizing influence because uh, given uh, what he had been doing, okay, we, we threw him out of Kuwait. He's going someplace else next. He, he's just that kind of a guy. Uh, he's, he's not going to say, yeah, okay, that didn't go well. And, you know, I'll, I'll just sit back, kick back and chill and everything will be fine. He, he would start a conflict someplace else. So, yes, getting rid of him was good. Uh, unintended consequences. Now the Sunni and Shia were going at each other. The Iranians, you know, used as a proxy the uh, Shia. The Sunni used, uh, Saudi Arabia used the Sunni as their proxy. Uh, the Kurds who don't actually have a country, but they're in a region, uh, are persecuted by all the countries they're in. Uh, the Kurds that are up north in Iraq are also in the north of Iran, the northeast of Syria, the east of Turkey. And they're one of the groups that got along best with American and coalition forces, and they don't have a country mainly because some guy with a pen after World War I started drawing lines in the Middle East, divvying up the Middle East uh, territory to colonial powers. And we've been paying for that ever since because these were city states and tribal nations and somebody decided to make them countries. And pretty much it's not working.
was there at any time any effort to put in air conditioning in either the vehicles or the buildings for, for the Americans? Oh, yes. Um, as, as time went on, um, uh, the initial buildings we're in were bombed out buildings, uh, government buildings that we were occupying. And as time went on, yes, they, they started bringing in air conditioners. Uh, the vehicles were never, well, I should say never. The active duty had up armored Humvees and those did have air conditioning, but not the air conditioning like you would have in your car. Uh, and of course the turrets open. So any of the air conditioning coming in is just blowing out the top of the turret. Uh, they did build barracks uh, and we got to stay in them. That was in uh, Falcon Fob in the south side of Baghdad. Uh, and they did have heaters and air conditioners. Uh, at about that time, they were bringing in uh, trailers and there was a large field uh, at, Bag at the Baghdad International Airport, a, a fairly large complex. And these trailers uh, did have air conditioning and it also heating and light. Uh, so creature comforts were being met. Uh, we, at our FOB, the first FOB we were in was a small FOB. We ate out of a field kitchen. Uh, we ate what's called tray pack, which is kind of like uh, TV dinners for 20. You know, there'd be a tray. Uh, it would contain a serving of, you know, 20 servings of turkey and another foil tray that contain, contained 20 servings of mashed potatoes, another tray that had 20 servings of gravy and another tray with 20 servings of beans, green beans. And they would boil these trays and they'd zip them open with a big, can opener and serve them out. Uh, it wasn't bad, uh, it was boring, uh, but it was good food. But if you got to the bigger fobs, they were catered by Kellogg, Brown and Root. And in the morning you would get eggs to order, uh, sausage, ham, bacon, cereals, pancakes, French toast, whatever you wanted, just like you know a dining facility at probably a college, uh, lunch, you know, several entrees to choose from, uh, several starches, uh, several vegetables, uh, a sandwich bar, soup and sandwich bar. You know, the food is very good at the larger fobs. Uh, but then if you got in one of the more remote areas, you were back to tray pack and or the packaged meals ready to eat. Uh, a lot of the tray pack and meals ready to eat were used in Afghanistan because they moved around so much. We were pretty stagnant once we occupied Baghdad with the larger forward operating bases. So food was good. Uh, Kellogg, Brown and Root came in with a laundry facility. <laughs> this is great. We had a laundry facility. You could get your uniforms, uh, uh, patches sewn on. Uh, you could get an espresso but we couldn't get rounds for our Mark 19 grenade launchers. But I could have clean BDUs in two days. Why? I have no idea. I don't know. It, it was some of the craziest things. Uh, we had communications going back home, which when it was run by the military was archaic and then they would contract with the locals and I could pick up a phone like I was right sitting right here in Middlefield you know calling and I was in Baghdad and I get instant communication uh, we try to use our internet with the military and forget it they brought in and created computer rooms I could get on Yahoo almost without fail and communicate with back home and that was also another problem I go back to, you know, being overseas 69, 70, 71, and you couldn't call home. And you'd write a letter and it'd take, you know, 10 days to two weeks to get home, then 10 days to two weeks to get a response. Well, we had instantaneous communications towards the end of our deployment in 2004. And I can remember we were out there on an administrative run. We were going to the post office. We were going someplace else. 
you know, we weren't looking for trouble. We were just administrative run. And we had to, we, we got held over. We we're supposed to be back at four o'clock and we had to do something else. No big deal. Again, administrative. And one of my troops starts, you know, waking out. I mean, he's all beside himself. What, what's the matter? You know, we we're supposed to be back at four. We'll, we'll be back at five, five thirty. Uh, we're not going to miss Chow. He goes, I told my mom we were going to be out. I told her we'd be back by four and I'd send her an email. She's going to think I'm dead. Okay. Formation. Don't tell anybody where you're going to be. Don't make any promises. And this was, this is one of the problems, you know, you could have instantaneous communication. Now I'd call home and I'd talk to the wife. I couldn't tell her what we were doing. Not because it was secret. People were getting hurt and dying. And I didn't want to talk to her about that. And she wants, she wants me on the phone and she wants me on that phone talking for an hour. I got nothing to say. And, you know, the cube next to me is a younger soldier. And I love you. No, oh, I love you. I love you more. Oh, no. And this goes on for 20 minutes. And his whole paycheck went to phone cards. And it was it was things like that. Hold on, I gotta not answer that. So, uh, you know, talking with you know, explaining the kids. Don't make any promises to your family. Uh, just, just you know. We never know where we're going to be. There, there was a time we, we were on a warning order to pack it up and we were going to move a hundred miles and we were going to be in a very remote area and we were not going to have communications like this anymore. And we were going to be eating MRAs and they start, you know, calling home, telling their parents, maybe it was classified, maybe it wasn't. But next thing you know, the parents think, you know, they're going into a combat operation. They're all going to get killed. And it's like, you know, guys, please don't do this to your families. And, uh, you know, instant communication was nice and it was also a nightmare. Well, I'm going to wrap you know, up. I'm sorry. The, the, these were really young kids, though, and probably had never been away from home. And mommy cares, and oh, I, I, no, no doubt, yes. <laughs> uh, the bulk of our troops were under twenty-two years old. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I can understand that. I, but I also don't want them scaring the hell out of their parents. Of course, of course. You know, yeah. in World War Two, loose links, loose lips sink ships. You couldn't say anything. Well, in, in the first Desert Storm. A uh, young lady from Connecticut was killed. And there's a whole procedure for uh, notification. Right. And unfortunately, there's the bureauc bureaucracy of doing that notification. So well, one of her friends gets on a satellite phone and calls her parents screaming and crying, she's dead. So now the notification team gets there and the parents are, you know, screaming. I mean, because you can make that call doesn't mean you should. Uh, the notification teams are trained. There's usually a chaplain, an officer, and somebody who knows the soldier that goes with the team. Uh, of course, the chaplain is trained for that. The notification officer is trained for that. They know all the thing. They know what to expect from the parents, the, the different levels of, of grief, uh, of uh, uh, disbelief, of lashing out at them. They've been trained. Not that it helps to be trained because they're still, those, those three guys are going to take a beating. Uh, but they're better equipped than somebody screaming on a satellite phone, your daughter's dead. My father was killed in World War II, and that's why I'm connected to this group. And my mother found out two weeks before she was notified because she 
and my father were friends with another couple and they had an agreement who would write to whom. And so my mother's, the wife of my father's friend called my mother's parents and they came and told her. And she was notified several weeks later, officially. Yeah. And good questions, you know, but I it, know it, it, was, it wouldn't be two weeks with our communication, but it would still be eight to 12 hours. Well, you know, this was World War II. It was, right. you know, very different it, 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 times. <laughs> and they were running a war and they didn't have the, presumably, the resources to go and tell the widows. Correct. And, you know, it wasn't a high priority by comparison. No, 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 I understand. Thank you, Mark. I'm, the book will be in the library. I know it's backwards right now, but um, we have to wrap up now. And it, thank you very, very much. I mean, you're absolutely correct. People don't know. And we want to get that story out there. So thank you. Oh, thank you for having thank me. You. Uh, I, thank I, you. I, I do like talking about the unit. Uh, they, they were magnificent. Uh, they accomplished every mission they were given. Uh, when things were at the worst, they were at the best. Thank made you. me very proud. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.